Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. And by now, in this society we live in, everyone understands that information is something very important, whether it's the kind of information we get over the internet in terms of news and what's happening, what the weather's going to be like the next day, but also information in a more technical sense. If you have a company needs information about what sales are going on, where the customers are, what products are available, and what you should be selling. If you're a scientist, information is the data that you have about the universe. Information is another way of thinking about what we know about the world. So it's an extremely general concept. But there is so much information around us right now that it becomes a subject in its own right to understand what information is and how best to harness it. And there's really no better person to talk to than today's guest, Cesar Hidalgo. Cesar was trained as a physicist, but he quickly got into the idea of statistical mechanics of information, which led him, believe it or not, into economics. And he started studying not just economics in its own right, but how data flows through economic channels and how it becomes actual physical products. So now, after spending a long time as the lead of MIT's collective learning group, Cesar is newly a chair at the University of Toulouse in France, but he's also the head of a startup company called Data Wheel. He's been very involved in data visualization and how that can help us understand what's happening in different places around the world. I can really recommend his book called Why Information Grows that starts much like this conversation you're about to listen to does from the basics of what we mean by information information at the level of physics or even philosophy into how information moves around, whether it's through a biological organism, through a society, through a culture, through an economy. It's a different lens. It's a different way of thinking about what's going on all around us. And uh, Cesar is a very charismatic proponent of thinking about information in interesting ways. So I think you're going to like this. Uh, Let's go. Cesar Hidalgo, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. So you do you started as a physicist, is that right? That's right. And you moved through, at, at any point, were you officially an economist? No, I never got a degree in economics, but I've been working on topics related to economics, I would say now, for 14, 15 years. Okay, so you know the lingo, you're, you're pretty... Exactly, and I have a lot of that. colleagues and enemies. in <laughs> <laughs> Colleagues and enemies, good yeah. way to put it. But now you're also very interested in data visualization and things like that. So to people who are not an expert in any of these areas, what is the 30,000 foot view of all this? Like, how do you think of your project of putting these things together? So the way that I define my work is I say that I focus on collective learning. So what I try to do is to understand how teams, cities, nations, and countries learn. How do they acquire new knowledge and how they put that new knowledge to use? And to do that, I do a lot of things. I I study the creation, diffusion, and valuation of knowledge. And I've contributed a lot to that literature on economic geography and innovation. But I also have created lots of platforms to integrate and distribute large volumes of public and private data as a way to improve the way that we see our world. Okay. And does the physics background help you here? I think so, because at the end of the day, what you rescue from an education like that of physics is that to understand the world, you need to always have an interplay between theories and experience, you know? So uh, that duality is useful in physics, but it's useful in economics and it's useful in in uh, most other fields. So I do think that my work still is always in the boundary between what the data is telling us and how we interpret it. Okay. But even more than that, you have, so I, I read your wonderful book, Why Why Information Grows? Yes. And uh, the word information is obviously playing a large role here, right? And information has different definitions in different contexts. It's closely related to things like entropy that physicists care about. So wh- wh- how do you think about information? What is your idea as soon as you say that word? Yeah. And of course, it depends with whom I'm talking to, but in in a more technical sense, I like to think of information as like the sort of like third thing that is very basic and important to understand. So in the universe, we have sort of things, you know, we can mm-hmm. think of matter, things that we can, you know, we can touch or that, that have some sort of embodiment, you know, but we also have the movement of those things. We can think of in terms of energy and momentum and so forth. But there's a third, you know, quantity that we need to consider, which is not things nor how they're moving, 
but how they're arranged or ordered. Mm. You know? And to me, that's the basic idea of information. You know, it's like, you know, the sequence of things, the way in which you stack a deck of cards. If you shuffle a deck of cards, you don't change the mass, you don't change the energy, but you're changing something. That order is information. I guess probably people, when you say the word information, uh, they think that information is about something, right? That it contains meaning, not just not just data. So when you shuffle a deck of cards, the meaning doesn't really change, or maybe it does. I'm not quite sure how you think about it. Yeah, so maybe a better analogy than a deck of cards is to think of DNA. Uh -huh. right? So if I change the sequence of you know nucleic acids on DNA, I can transform you know one piece of DNA from encoding one protein to encoding a different protein. Like that protein and what it does, and you know in the context in which it's being used, you can think of that as the meaning. But the little piece of DNA that is a certain sequence doesn't know really about that meaning. That meaning is beyond it. It's, it's, it's part of the environment and the way that that sequence of order interacts with the rest of the environment. So I try to think of information when I think about it in fundamental terms as those sequences. But of course, when I'm talking with someone, for example, from the field of communication or media studies, I understand that information there is much more related to meaning and you can have concepts like misinformation, which mm. in the DNA example, you know, would be a little bit, you know, harder to, to, to build. I guess that's what that's what I'm trying to get at. So for the DNA molecule, or just for a set of letters on a page, is any arrangement equally contain the same amount of information, or do they contain more information if the context they're in cares about what they say in some way? Well, you know, it, it depends on which definition we're using again. So, so if we're thinking kind of from a pure Shannon perspective, you know, basically a random sequence is going to be the one that contains more information more because information, yeah. it's the hardest to predict, right. you know? Even though but, it means nothing. Exactly. But let's say now we're in the context of communication, you know, and I'm trying to communicate something to you. Well, the words that are going to contain more information are the ones that reduce your uncertainty more about what I'm trying to say, yeah. you know? So maybe a more useful way to think about information in that context is not simply how many bits do I need to encode something, but how much do I reduce your uncertainty with each bit that I provide to you? Okay, good. This is sounding nice and physics-y, and, and I like this. <laughs> We're going to get to the role of information in economies and firms and networks and things like that. But let's stick with the physics angle here. I mean, how do you think about the origin of information, you know, all the way back to sort of the evolution of the universe or the evolution of life or something like that? Yeah. That's a good question because in, in, in some way, uh, information and, and order and complexity is conspicuous in our planet. You know? mm -hmm. So we, we're marveled at it every time we go and see a landscape or, or, you know, like walk around the city. But at the same time, you know, if we were to take a spaceship and, and, and travel, you know, across our solar system or, or beyond, we would see a universe that is quite barren. Mm -hmm. You know, complexity is not everywhere. Complexity actually concentrates in places like, like our planet. And, and, it leads us to ask why. Why is our planet so rich in complexity, where other places, you know, are so barren? You know, and like the moon is not exactly that the, the, the moon is, is not complex. Or even like if you go to the Atacama Desert here in our planet, you're gonna find you know places that actually you know don't have too much structure beyond in the geological formations that you can find there. And, and some telescopes these days, by the way. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> So um, to understand the origin of, of this complexity and disorder, I think the, the best solutions that I found there is work like that of Ilya Prigozhin. Mm -hmm. you know? So Ilya, you know, as, as you know very well, is a very famous you know, statistical physicist and chemist you know, that he started to study uh, physical systems that were out of equilibrium, you know, near equilibrium, but out of it. And, and he found that those systems that were out of equilibrium tended to self-organize into what he called dissipative structures. You know? So think of the little whirlpool that forms when you take the plunger out of a bathtub. You know, that's a structure that is, is not haphazard. You know, there, there are correlations there, there's certain order, there's structure, you know, and that structure uh, is, is uh, something that emerges you know, when that system is uh, going through a state in which it's flowing. You know, in the mm -hmm. system in which it's, it's like going from one energy state to another. So he says when the systems are out of equilibrium, when they're moving from one state to another, they kind of organize. And that is an important clue because if we think about it, a lot of the structure that we observe in nature, you know, it's in life. And life is an out of equilibrium system that has to be sustained by energy flows. We have to eat 
many times a day, you know, we're breathing and, you know, we do get energy also out of the oxygen that we breathe. So there, there's, you know, a lot of energy consumption that we need to stay out of equilibrium because the only way to maintain our level of organization is to stay out of that equilibrium. So I think Prigozhin is the one that gives us a first good clue of why there's structure in the universe. Yeah, so in other words, from the perspective of someone like me, if you just let the system go all by itself, it would go to a maximum entropy state, right? It'd be boring equilibrium. It would, you know, the the bathtub would just become flat, right? The, the water on top of it. But you're, you're saying following Prigogine that in the right circumstances, if you feed it some energy, in fact, some energy in a low entropy form, then it, then it, it obtains this orderly configuration, I guess. Exactly. And that's conspicuous not only in biology. Now uh, our lives live around electronics that, you know, they become useless the moment that the battery runs out, you know? So they're able to process information, they're able to, you know, show information on their screens, you know, encoded as, as, as pixels or, or whatever you're using as a display type of technology because they're consuming energy. So that energy consumption, you know, is essential to kind of like keep order because otherwise, you know, entropy does what it does. So what should we say that differentiates really the Earth from the moon in this case? I mean, we're at the same distance from the sun, right? Yeah, but I think here there's a lot of things that have happened that allow us to preserve information effectively, you know, uh, and there's also like a chemical complexity that maybe might be missing in places like the moon. So on the one hand, we do have an atmosphere, you know, that makes a big difference, you know, and we do have, you know, oceans, you know, which, you know, also uh, make, uh, big difference. And those uh, structures together with others have been able to create path dependencies, you know, for replicators like, you know, DNA and RNA, you know, to um, create order, sustain it and reproduce it. So in some way, the complexity that we observe today is not the result of like an instantaneous event or, or a condition that is present today on earth and not present in the moon, but also of a long path dependent process in which this complexity has grown over time because we're able to generate more of it per unit of time than we lose, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess if I, I haven't actually thought about this, so I'm going to say things that could be disastrously wrong, but probably Venus, even though it has an interesting looking atmosphere, the surface of it from the few pictures that we have doesn't look that different from the moon, right? I mean, it's kind of like there are some rocks lying around and nothing more organized than that. And probably there are conditions specifically to Earth related to the existence of both solids and liquids and things like that that allow for these channels to open up and complexity to, to develop. Is that the right way to think about I, it? I think so, yeah. And of course, you know, uh, this is a tough question. If, if we would have a succinct answer, we would have had you know, like uh, the the soundbite that solves the problem of the origins of life. I know, yeah. You know, but I, I do think that even though we might not have that, we do have clues of some of the conditions, you know, that, that lead, you know, to the creation of complex structures such as life. And one of those is the need, you know, to have energy flows, but the need also of not losing them that quickly, you know, and to be able to preserve the structure. And, and here on planet Earth, we do that by, you know, having certain solids and crystals that, you know, uh, support that structure. For instance, you know, DNA is a very stable molecule that is able to preserve a lot of complexity and information over, you know, long periods of time. And, you know, with the ability to replicate, it allows, you know, us to have the conditions that we need not only to preserve information, but then to make it grow. And it's not even perfectly stable, right? I mean, if, if DNA were absolutely stable, never changed, wouldn't do the job. You need this kind of this flexibility, I guess. Exactly. You need to be able to explore, you know, the, those spaces of configurations so that you can actually then, you know, grow in complexity because complexity requires diversity. So there's some simple version of information, which is just that, you know, when entropy is low, there's secret, in some sense, there's a lot of information because you know a lot about the system. But but you're making the point that it's this complexity that gives us the ability to really make use of that information. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah, I do think that complexity in many ways is, is kind of like a better term, you know, uh, maybe because a little bit more loosely defined for most people. You know, but <laughs> I, I do think that, you know, when you talk about the planet, Earth as a planet that has a lot of information, maybe people, you know, think about like the media and the libraries. When you think about it as, as a place that is very complex, maybe people get a better idea that we're talking right. about like that, that complexity that is involved in ecosystems and our society that is absent from the moon and it's also absent from libraries. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this interplay, I wish I understood it better, maybe because no one does, between 
complexity and in information, right? In some sense, you're making the point that complexity makes use of information and information makes complexity possible. So they're, uh, I'm not sure they're the same thing, but they're at least symbiotic. Yeah, I do. I do think that they're related and are part of kind of like a, you know, a set of symbiotic relationships. The other aspect that I do think is important on, on, on that relationship is what I call the capacity to compute, you know? So mm. if we go back to the DNA analogy, you can think of the DNA and you can think of the cell. And DNA by itself is, is quite useless. It, it cannot reproduce by itself. It requires all of this machinery, you know? And the same is true for a lot of the information that we have. It's like a recipe without a kitchen, you know, and without a cook, you know, cannot transform itself into a dish. So we do have also that ability to then grab a piece of encoded information uh, as a set of instructions and transform it into something. That ability to transform information into new information or to reproduce it or to recombine it you know, is that computational capacity that we've served in biology, we've served in society, and that I think is the true mystery. So I call that like knowledge. And my separation between knowledge and information is information is what is encoded and knowledge is this ability to make. You know? Okay. And you can make things by, you know, making a car. A car is information, you know, it's an organized structure just like DNA, you know. Or, you know, you can have knowledge when you are making a new cell type, you know, as cells differentiate, you know. And that knowledge, that ability to make is ultimately what is hard to accumulate both at the biological level and at the social level. And you said the word before compute, the ability to compute. Now you're saying the ability to make. Are those the same thing? Like in, in a lax <laughs> language, you know, yeah. uh, when we're, we're talking. We can be lax, don't worry. Exactly, at 30,000 feet <laughs> away from or more, you know. Yes, I would say, you know, you have these order structures and you have the ability to make those order structures. You know, that ability to make, we can call it the ability to compute, the ability to transform a string of bits into mm. another string of bits where those bits are encoded on a magnetic tape or on a piece of DNA, you know, from this uh, perspective, it would be relevant. Of course, you know, there are other situations in which you want to make those distinctions. Right. And, and presumably there's also phase transitions or at least transformations along the way where the system becomes better and better at accumulating and using information. Yep, yep. So life would be one multicellular life. I, I'm, I'm thinking of all these things. I just had a podcast a, a little while ago with Kate Jeffrey, who is a neuroscientist. And, she, you know, I, I had given a talk saying how complexity can evolve. And she wanted to say, yes, but also it goes away sometimes because there are disastrous events. And exactly. it's not at all guaranteed that it comes in and just grows monotonically. Yeah, indeed. And, and I think that's true for, you know, economies, societies and ecosystems. You know, like we've seen the collapse of ecosystems. We, we might be risking, you know, a big ecosystem collapse now with climate change, you know. And we do see it in social processes, like, like process of social unrest. You know, there are countries mm. that sometimes everybody thinks that they're going fine and, you know, things, you know, turn uh, very quickly. You know, like what's happening in Chile this week, what, you know, has happened in, in many places in the past. Yeah, no, and worldwide, this is definitely going on. So that so let's make that transition. So you know, let's <laughs> let's presume that in the last fifteen minutes, everyone understands the origin of life and how it takes in low entropy energy. Um, at what point does life become economics? At what point do we talk about trading information back yeah. and forth like that? So, so what I try to communicate in why information grows. I don't know if I succeed, but what I try to communicate is at the end of the day. You have these systems that have a finite ability to accumulate knowledge, to accumulate that capacity to make. And the only way that those systems can transcend that limited capacity is by developing you know, collective phenomena or collective systems that include multiple units. So you go from single cellular organisms to multicellular organisms because you could never achieve the level of complexity of a multicellular organism with a single celled organism. But multicellular organisms, you know, they peak at the human, let's say, you know. So far, as far as we know. As yeah. far as we know, <laughs> you know. And humans are also of limited capacity. The older you get, the more that you realize that you know very, 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 very little, you know, about everything that could eventually be known. So humans transcend that capacity by forming teams. Teams transcend those capacities by forming organizations. Organizations transcend those capacities by belonging to industries, you know, and also by having cities. And you have this different, like, Russian doll structure of organizations that then grow all the way to our planet in which we are able to accumulate more complexity and more knowledge, more of an ability to make by always renormalizing ourselves into, you know, groups of the units that bumped into a ceiling. 
So division of labor in some sense is really exactly. what's, what's getting but, us all this mileage. But division of knowledge, which I would say is different ah, okay. than the division of labor because like, I can have a division of labor in which we're all doing the same thing and we have more of us doing the same thing. You know, but the division of knowledge is quite different because we're doing different things and we're passing on, you know, those inputs to each other as a way to create things that would be impossible for each one of us to do. So when you're making an aircraft, it's not that you have a hundred thousand people company in which everybody's making an aircraft by themselves, you know, with a hammer and, right. you know, and, and, and with some metal, you know, it's everybody's doing something different and that allows them, you know, to create a few aircraft a year, you know, that are the product. Now, if you are in a lower complexity, let's say activity, like the production of t-shirts, in that case, you might have more of a division of labor and less of a division of knowledge. You might have, you know, warehouses full of seamstress that they're all doing the same task, doing the same shirt. And in that case, you have more of a division of labor, you have economies of scale, but you don't have that division of knowledge that you would have served in a complex industry like pharmaceuticals or aircraft manufacturing. I presume that for a complicated aircraft, there's literally nobody who has all the knowledge. Of course, yeah, that's, that's the whole point. And that's the idea that, you know, basically, you know, uh, you can think of the complexity of an industry as the number of what I call person bites of knowledge. Person bites, yeah, B-Y-T-E-S. <laughs> exactly, you know, of knowledge that, that you would need, you know, to, to be able to create a product. Yeah, yeah okay. But, but was that, did we skip ahead? Uh, when I think of economics in general, I mean, I think of trade and barter and, you know, maybe currency and value. Um, and those can precede the sort of division of knowledge or, or, or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, so in some way, you know, my way to enter economics has been through a gap in the literature, you know, uh, that, that was there in which products were very much considered like some sort of epiphenomena that was not very differentiated in the economics literature. So, mm. you know, economics is a field that comes more from tradition of like bankers and merchants, you know? So it's kind of more like about trade and interest rate money. and prices, you <laughs> yeah. know, and, and money and, 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 you know, the cost of employment and those things. But, you know, whether you're producing ladders or you're producing, you know, apples or you're producing cars or, you know, you're producing t-shirts, you know, are things that are differentiated not you know, too much, you know, in the models and, and, the, uh, and the empirical work that was traditional in the literature. And I think I was lucky to enter the field at a moment in which uh, more fine-grained data was becoming available. And that allowed us to start characterizing products and industries, you know, in a more fine-grained matter, you know, not just by talking about how much labor or capital they need, but by actually looking at, you know, the, the patterns of production to be able to infer you know, uh, how much knowledge they need to be produced, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, other other properties that that differentiate them in ways that the traditional literature had not maybe paid attention to. So do you think that kind of differentiation was there from the start, from the first primitive economies, or is it something that allowed economies to take off later in the game? Um, the, no, the differentiation is actually very hard to achieve. So one thing that is is quite conspicuous when you look at international trade data or you look at data on the geography of industrial, economic, uh, or innovative activities, you know, in a country, is that as you move from the simpler economic units, the towns, to the more complex, the cities, or you move from countries that you know are relatively down in the development ladder to the ones that are at the top, you have like this subset structure in which diversity grows, you know, with the level of development and complexity, mm -hmm. so that the places that do few things, they not only do few things, they do things that are common to the places that do many things, you know? So you have kind of like this world in which creating that diversity is difficult, and those that don't have it are stuck not only with a primitive and limited offer, but one that is very redundant with everyone else. So it's, it's very uncompetitive too. So these are also mechanisms that would actually help us explain, you know, part of the inequality because, you know, if what I can do is something that everybody can do, mm. and it's a few set of things, it's very hard for me to be competitive and have a decent income. If I can do a lot of things that nobody else can do and people want, I think I have it made. 
I want to pause to talk about Peloton home exercise bikes. This is really one of my favorite ways to work out, mostly because it's just so flexible. The idea of having an exercise bike is a great one. It's a really good workout. Cardiovascular fitness is important. We all know that. But the idea that you can do it whenever you want and still enjoy the features of a class with an instructor sort of egging you on. So I don't know how your schedule works. I don't know when I'm going to have time to work out and so forth. And also, my motivation comes and goes. So I like having someone there telling me what to do. It's a virtual person if you're on Peloton. So you can either sign up for a live class or a large library of pre-taped classes. Now Peloton has a new 30-day home trial. So you buy the service and try it out worry-free for 30 days. If you decide it's not for you, you can return the bike for a full refund. Peloton will even come and pick it up at no cost. So this holiday, give the gift to Peloton. Use a promo code MINDSCAPE at OnePeloton.com, that's O-N-E Peloton, P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com, and get $100 off accessories when you purchase the Peloton bike. But, okay, but so when, when, when I think about um, division of labor, and maybe division of knowledge goes the same way, I think about, you know, the Industrial Revolution. I think about Henry Ford building the Model T yeah. in, a, in an assembly line. I have too many questions to ask. That's why I'm hesitating here. How did that get started? Who invented that? Was that was that a sort of a side product of other technological information uh, innovations like the printing press, or um, is there a story to tell about how information bred upon itself? So now we have more of like a big history question yeah. here, you know, like like the yeah. So in in that big history perspective, I, I do think that there's kind of like a long, you know, line of events, but there are also some transitions that I think are, are very important. You know, the first one that someone like Yuval Harari like emphasizes quite a bit on, on sapiens is like the cognitive revolution. It's like the development of language and, and there's some particular properties of language, you know, uh, that we have because human languages are not like animal communication systems, we have the ability to talk about hypothetical things, you know? Mm -hmm. So a, a, um, a, an ape can have the ability to maybe tell another ape that there's danger or that there's a lion or there's a snake, but they cannot tell them about their idea for their new blockbuster film, you know? <laughs> that idea to talk about fiction was a big, you know, cognitive revolution that happened, you know, 80,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, you know? And uh, that is expressed in, in in things like the development of you know like more advanced tools and and an acceleration of our ability to you know uh, accumulate knowledge and, and so forth. Then we have the agricultural revolution, you know, which people know about. That's you know much more recent, about like ten thousand years ago. You know, with that we finally start uh, accumulating slowly people into cities. You know, that agglomeration is really important because. At the end of the day, you know, it just like uh, biology, you know, accumulates knowledge, you know, in, in DNA and that knowledge has to be preserved and passed on to the next generation, we humans accumulate cultural knowledge and, and if we're all dispersed in small groups, the ability to accumulate knowledge and ideas through generations, you know, is limited. But once we start forming cities, we start, you know, living together, we're going to accumulate more knowledge. We're going to have maybe also people that are going to be dedicated, you know, to those aspects of life. In the beginning, maybe religious leaders, you know, and political leaders and so forth. And um, the next revolution, I would say, in the sequence of events, at least the way that I understand them, uh, is the writing revolution, you know, um, that is, is very important uh, in ancient Greece, you know, like even though writing is older than ancient Greeks, you know, it was not that prevalent and it was not that advanced, you know, uh, it was like much more based on like, you know, accounting systems or or, or, or even in, in, in administration and, and religious events. But in ancient Greece, you know, writing kind of like explodes as a form of expression that is used to communicate, you know, and, and document like complex ideas. And they go through something that could be considered similar to the Renaissance, you know, that happened yeah. later, you know, they actually get close, you know, to maybe, you know, like what could have been an industrial revolution, maybe, you know, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if history would have uh, worked differently, you know, and that writing revolution produces a lot of knowledge. And then after the writing revolution, which I would date, you know, loosely around 700 BC, to me, the next big revolution and what is the starting point of everything that is modern is the printing press, you know, because when uh, Gutenberg, you know, adapts the printing press, you know, that, that, that existed in Asia and, and develops this removable type printing press, uh, 
what what happens are, are a lot of things. First, you know, and this is all from Elizabeth Einstein's work, you know, the printing press as an agent of change. But uh, first, you know, for the first time, scientists and scholars can have access to multiple books. Like before printing, like only kings had little libraries, <laughs> books were transcribed by hand, yeah. and everybody has written a book quickly realizes that no matter how cool your life is, you don't have enough stories. You have to read to, and share other people's stories to fill up your books, you know? Second, you know, uh, what happens also is that printing is the first economic activity that is urban and scalable. Think before printing. What was the way in which you could make money, like that you could make it big, you know? Well, you know, you had to have access to resources where it is a lot of land and a lot of serfs, mm -hmm. you know, that would like farm that land. Or you might have access to maybe mineral resources or you like looted next door town or something like that. But printing was something that you could produce in a city, you know, with a relatively small type of, uh, team of people. It was kind of like, you know, sort of IP intensive, very yeah. IP intensive. But if you have a book that's sold and you could sell copies, you could, you know, become rich really quickly. And evidence of that is that the number of printers per capita in Europe stabilized after only 50 years. Huh. So it was so a huge- So it went from zero to 60 very quickly. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it was a huge economic boom. Like in 50 years, you know, you stabilized that number because you had an activity that basically was very profitable, was very urban. So it's the first time that kind of like someone in the city, you know, can really start making it big by manufacturing something at scale. You know, it's really the first type of like, you know, mass production is printing, you know? And then and we, it was it was content as we would call it today, right? Yes, it, that, yeah. that was the point. You got to monetize your content for the first time ever. Yeah. Uh, so that I think is is huge, and you know it gives rise to like an, a new cognitive revolution. You know that we we call the Enlightenment. You know eventually, you know that that involves a lot of the the most important discoveries of you know science in the middle of of the last uh, millennia, and. And after that, you know, as, as society chugs along and, you know, the 16th, 17th century comes along, you know, printing accelerates, you know, like it takes 200 years for people to discover that you could print short formats, okay? Like, okay. <laughs> like, like magazines and pamphlets and so forth. Eventually those lead to a change of institutions, you know? So, you know, I, it's hard to understand the transition from, you know, monarchies to democracy without printing. Uh, and, you know, after those changes of institutions, you know, and with the acceleration of science and technology, we develop new forms of communication, like, you know, film and radio, then television, now the internet. And I, I like to think of the history of our planet or of our last, you know, um, thousands of years as a history of changes in communication technologies that have reconfigured the way that we create and process information and that we generate and, uh, and produce knowledge. And those are the eras that, to me, have contributed to this big history. Yeah, no, that's very helpful because uh, I guess we glossed it over a little bit. But in your book, you certainly emphasize the fact that not only there's this thing called information, but it's embodied, it's crystallized, right? Yeah. It's, it's There's some stuff that carries the information. And all of these changes in communication technology, which sounds sort of mundane when you put it that way, they're new information flow technologies, oh, right? And if, yeah. if you make it cheaper for information to flow, you enable a lot of new things. They're, they're huge and, and they're always laughed upon when, when they first merge, <laughs> you know? Like nobody took Twitter seriously and I, probably now is the, the the first thing that politicians take seriously, you know? <laughs> because like- it, You still it, complain it, about it, but yeah, it's yeah, important. It's, it's, it's quick, like, in, for instance, think of like uh, the music industry. You know, a lot of people are sort of like surprised that musicians cannot make money anymore. But <laughs> if you think about it from the perspective of communication technologies, what it's curious is that there was a short period of time in which they could make money. Yeah. Because there were musicians at the time of the ancient Greek. There are musicians still today. But for most history, musicians only could perform live. And, you know, live performance were hard to monetize. They couldn't spread. But as, you know technology evolved and you had radio and then more than radio, you had then records, records. you know? Those yeah. records, you know, allowed to constrain the diffusion of music in such a way that you could monetize it because music was trapped on those, you know, discs. It was trapped, you know, on those magnetic tapes and you could make a killing because, you know, the marginal cost of producing a new tape or a disc was very small. You know, you could sell them for 10, $15, you know? And all of the musicians that, that were big in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they're loaded, you know? Nowadays, you know, it's impossible to make money that way because music cannot be trapped in a physical media. 
and and what was curious is that musicians could make money for a while. So the it, that's that's an interesting way to put it. It had to be shareable, but not too shareable. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. that sweet spot, and I wonder what lessons there are for other things. I wonder if it books it the same way. I mean, certainly as someone who writes books, you probably feel the same way. The first thing that happens when you write a book is pirated versions appear on the internet, exactly. but they're not that better than the physical book. So I don't think it's doing a huge amount of damage. Um, that's interesting. Okay, so. Um, that that flow of information through different media obviously affects what people can do. But then, how? Where do we get to things like Henry Ford? And you have this wonderful example in the book of this giant plant. Uh, I, I've never heard of it before. But there was, you know, uh, what what was it called? The River Rouge. River Rouge. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know about this before. But to this day, that was the largest, you know, uh, integrated facility. I don't know because I've been to China a lot and. Like, okay, maybe like they, they have one. amazing stuff there. <laughs> but that, it didn't yeah. grow monotonically. There was a peak at that moment. Yeah, exactly. So the River Rouge, you know, was this, you know, fantastic plant, you know, that 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 Ford created that that literally like took like soybeans and metal, you know, on, on one end and, and produced cars out of the other because it was a complete vertical integration. Yeah. I would say today we don't manufacture anything with that level of vertical integration. Like value chains are very distributed and international. You know, that's for instance why like Trump tariffs are kind of like stupid when it involves Mexico because, you know, the U.S. value chain in the automotive sector, like, you know, which is the number one country uh, in the exports of beer? It's also Mexico because, you know, a lot of like the U.S. Yeah. beer is manufactured. <laughs> so like the value chains are integrated and disaggregated uh, between different countries, you know, uh, and we don't have those monolithic models. But at, at the time, you know, of, of Henry Ford, you know, where like transportation was not that good. That's why, you know, those 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 slow cars were such a good business, you know. Uh, you you needed maybe to produce that level of vertical integration to be able to get the economies of scale that he needed, you know, to produce affordable vehicles. You know, uh, nowadays things are different, but um, it's impressive, you know, what they were able to do at some point. Uh, I mean, again, maybe it's a version of a sweet spot in that they had the differentiation of knowledge enough to do the economy of scale, but it was still expensive to do things all over the place. So bringing it together in the same geographic location was a useful thing. But I, I think in the book you have this example, I'm going to mangle it, but you know, in Chile you can mine copper and other raw materials and you would like to have a battery and you can in principle make them, but it's actually cheapest to just send your raw materials to Korea, have them make the batteries and then buy it Back. Yes, so that's a good point because at the end of the day, you know, like for us to produce things, you need to combine, you know, like, you know, materials, technology and knowledge, you know, and the way that the world works is that the world is kind of like lazy, yeah, like we, mm -hmm. like basically we try to minimize costs, <laughs> that's, that's a, a more economist way of putting it, but uh, because of that, you have to ask yourself the question, what is easier to move? Is it easier to move the knowledge? Is it easier to move the materials? Is it easier to move the technology? What are the factors that are easy to move? And, and the hardest factor to move is knowledge, you know? So there seems a, weird. I mean, knowledge is not very heavy, but it's, it's hard to move it from brain to brain, I suppose. It's super heavy because um, people tend to confuse knowledge with kind of like encoded pieces of information. You know, so like... Would you trust a brain surgeon that the only thing that has done is read Wikipedia pages about brain surgery <laughs> and has never been there? So, like, knowledge is very experiential. Or even have read a textbook. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Someone that had just read a textbook on, on brain surgery, I wouldn't allow them to operate, you know, and, and they don't, you know, like, that's why you have residencies and you have all of this, you know, practice systems, you know. Uh, but when it comes to like complex industries, you know, the knowledge is embedded on, on large teams and that makes it very hard to move. So, Knowledge has these temporary monopolies. So, for example, when Ford figures out how to build a car and he's able to put all of that together on the River Rouge and he's producing cars and there's other people producing cars also not that far from him. They're not producing cars in San Diego. They're producing mm. cars, you know, like they're in the Still Midwest. Detroit, yeah. Exactly, and Detroit, you know. And, and it expands kind of like from there because knowledge is hard to move. So it's easier to bring the steel there. It's bringing to be, the, you know, the, the coal and all of the other materials and nowadays, I think it's, it's kind of like the same, you know, like like Silicon Valley has monopolies over markets that they discover. China is now getting there because it's a country that is very technologically advanced and sophisticated. And the products are easier to move than the knowledge that you need to make them. So if you figure out something, you know, that people want, you're going to have that monopoly because the product is going to diffuse very quickly, you know, but the ability to make it is going to diffuse very slowly. And until it does, you know, there's going to be only a few people that are going to be able to supply that. And therefore, you know, 
they're going to have their day. And this is related to that distinction you draw between knowledge and know-how or explicit knowledge, I guess, and know-how. I mean, in some sense, there are things you can put in a book, but there are things that are just in the human brain or just in the individual people. And that's why it's heavy, because moving people is really hard. Exactly. So in the in the literature on on um, knowledge that is used traditionally on, on, on business schools and knowledge economics, innovation economics, people make a strong distinction between tacit and explicit knowledge. Mm. Explicit knowledge is all of the knowledge that I can communicate through an act of communication. I can codify that knowledge. Like the recipe that I can put on a cookbook is something, you know, that I could communicate through a page and therefore it's explicit knowledge. The experience of having cooked with, you know, the chefs from El Bulli or any famous restaurant is something, you know, that is much harder to communicate. So it would be considered tacit knowledge. So the best examples of tacit knowledge are think of sports. So imagine like Michael Jordan. He's extremely talented. He really knows how to handle a ball on, you know, a basketball court. Uh, but imagine you have a seminar and he speaks and tells you about basketball for like three days, you know. How much better of a player are you going to be after the third day? Epsilon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not, not that much, you know, because, you know, that knowledge is, is tacit and it's acquired through practice and the world is full of tacit knowledge and is the one that is hardest to see because it's not as obvious as the knowledge that we can codify. And closer to our experience, I don't know if you've had a professional basketball in your career in your past, but graduate school is the same way, right? You know, students come in, they know a lot of equations or whatever, but they don't know what it means to be a scientist. They haven't seen it in action. They haven't done it. I agree. Yeah. So I, I came to the U.S. for grad school and I, I had a very good advisor. You know, Laszlo Barabas is a very famous, oh, yeah. you know, physicist that works on networks and and, and so forth. And uh, I remember, like, soon I learned that I, I, it was a waste of time to go to him to like kind of like talk to him about like technical details stuff like that. That you should figure out by yourself. But what what I wanted to get out of him is like to understand okay when a problem is relevant. Right. You know how should I communicate case. to people? You know how sh is different people going <clears> to <throat> interpret this? All of those type of things. You know uh, how to think about you know like a career and and to connect the different things that you're doing. And those are things that are are hard to learn if you don't have a model of someone that you know, knows how to do them and you're kind of like learning as an apprentice. And and I think a lot of people sometimes don't understand that. I think the 20s, you know, you better get someone, you know, that <laughs> that is where you want to be and, and and be a very humble apprentice of them. So if we if we take this on board and we appreciate the importance of tacit knowledge and know-how and, and how difficult it is to move around, what are the lessons uh, that we get from that for either building an organization or organizing an economy or trade barriers and yeah. things like that? So there, there's a lot of lessons because there's a big literature on this, you know. And so there's a literature that looks at the geographic uh, diffusion of knowledge, you know. And as you can imagine, because knowledge is, is sticky, there's a lot of barriers to the diffusion. So it's hard for knowledge to travel long distances. Now, the reason why it's hard for knowledge to travel long distances is because it's socially embedded. So mm -hmm. like it's actually that social networks are geographically circumscribed and that limits the diffusion of knowledge. So then the question is, what are the things that limit the ability of people to create links? You know, you have language barriers, you have cultural barriers. All of those have been shown extensively to limit knowledge diffusion, to limit trade, to limit other things. You know? So the question then is like now, if you're a country or a city or a region that wants to develop their economy, you know, what you're trying to do is to accumulate knowledge. And the question is, how do you do it by following the laws of knowledge diffusion? Okay. You know? Uh, and here are examples of people that did it wrong and examples of people that did things better. You know, examples of doing it wrong. I don't know if you ever heard of the um, University of Yachay in Ecuador. No. So earlier this decade, uh, Rafael Correa, who was the president of Ecuador, uh, decided to put a billion dollars, you know, on the creation of a new city of science and technology that he hoped would compete with knowledge production centers across the world. Very idealistic, you know, plan, you know, a billion dollars in Ecuador is 1% of GDP, okay? So that's that's a lot of cake, yeah. you know? Uh, and basically, you know, what they did is they, they grabbed a piece of agricultural land like two hours north of Quito, and they tried to start building kind of like this university and city and industrial park and so forth, but 
you if you walk around, you know, a place like Kendall's Care of Manhattan, you know that you don't build a lot for a billion dollars, <laughs> yeah. you know? And if you have to bring every brick and every person that lay bricks to the place, you build even less. So quickly, like the plan, you know, like unraveled, you know, that university has gone through like six or seven, you know, uh, university presidents by now. They were able to track a few scientists to move there. Uh, you know, that didn't go well. You know, there was an article in Science, you know, talking about their experience and how they, 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 they some of them were leaving, some of them got fired. They got a few students there, like, like, like uh, at the beginning, like, I think it was just a thousand, you know, that became very radicalized because they, they believed on the dream. Mm. But, you know, a thousand dollars, you know, uh, sorry, a thousand students at a billion dollars. You know, that's a million dollars per student. So you could have put all of these kids in Stanford, you know, for like life, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so, so there were like, you know, and, and basically it was this idea that if you have enough money, you could create knowledge anywhere. Yeah. And that's not true because their process of diffusion that constrained the creation of knowledge. In the case of Ecuador, they had two chances. One was called Guayaquil, that one was called Quito, you know, which are the like two centers, you know, uh, where they have accumulated knowledge. And um, so what are the channels that, can promote knowledge diffusion. So one of them, which is really important and it's also very well documented is migration. Yeah. Uh, and migration is one channel that is also very biased towards the most talented people in the world. So there's a book by Bill Kerr, which is a professor at HBS that is called The Gift of Global Talent. Mm -hmm. And in that book, you know, you find a lot of interesting facts. One of them is like people, you know, without a college degree, about 1% of them migrate. People with a college degree is about like 5%. Inventors that have filed a patent, about 10%. Mm. Nobel Prize winners, about 31%. <laughs> Nobel Prize winners in the US since the 70s is like 60 something percent. Yeah, we get them off now everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. You know? So you do have kind of like this thing that there is a tale of talent that is extremely global and that is the one that helps create innovation, the ones that help create jobs, you know. It's similar, you get similar numbers if you focus not only on formal education and academic uh, credentials. If you look at people that have formed, you know, Fortune 500 companies or unicorns, they're super biased towards foreigns, you know. Uh, so then, you know, one of the lessons that you need to do is, you know, well, how do you attract that global talent, you know? Because at the end of the day, it's a game of global talent because also these talented, famous individuals are the ones that are going to help you attract other ones. The U.S. for a long time has had a huge advantage on that space. It receives about 50% of all of the PhDs that migrate in the world come only to one destination, which is the U.S. You know, and now that a falling percentage, I presume now may change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I that's a, a very believable story. I had two previous podcasts, uh, which made similar points. One with Jeffrey West uh, about how things yep. scale and, you know, um, the ingenuity and creativity certainly scales with population density in exactly. some way. And then another one with Will Wilkinson, where we talked about the political aspects of these and the openness to new ideas that was associated with cities versus a more conservative rural divide. But then, so that raises the question uh, that you brought up the word inequality earlier. Yeah. You know, it's great to attract the best talent and, you know, they, they want to be in these concentrations of brilliance and productivity. But then how do you spread the rewards of all that productivity and brilliance widely to everyone? Yeah. So that's tough, but I do think that we have found out a few things, you know, quite recently, actually. So... Um, Without going into the details, we might go into this later, but there are ways of measuring, you know, the knowledge intensity of economies, you know, like, mm -hmm. like how much knowledge is there in New York, vis-a-vis -vis San Diego, Tokyo, Moscow, whatever, you know? And when uh, you use those measures to look at knowledge concentration in cities or in countries, you do find relationships with inequality as well. So for instance, economies that are more complex tend to be less unequal, economies that are more extractive and less complex, sorry, economies that are more complex are less unequal. More and, equal. More equal, exactly. <laughs> okay. And economies that are less complex are more unequal. Okay. You know, so it's- That's not obvious to me. No, it's not obvious, but like, it's really hard to have the level of inequality of Switzerland with the industrial structure of Peru, mm. you know? So if, 
your exports are based on like three, four sectors mainly, you know, when those sectors are about, you know, mineral resource extraction that, you know, are industries that are very regimented and hierarchical, you know, because they're about like, you know, safety, about production. They're not about creativity. You don't want a miner to start digging anywhere and get creative, creativity you know, back or, down there, yeah. exactly. So uh, you have, uh, productive structures that are not geared towards, you know, uh, innovation and that, you know, uh, gears like towards structures that are more hierarchical and, and unequal. So at the international scale, you know, as economies become more complex, they become more equal. And as economies become less complex, they become more unequal. So for countries like, you know, like Chile and, you know, Peru and Angola, all of these countries that depend a lot on mineral resource extraction, whether these are fossil fuels or other forms of minerals, one thing that they need to do to reduce their inequality is they need to sophisticate their productive structure so they can generate those middle income jobs because yeah. those middle income jobs are not going to happen, you know, just through the redistributed policies. You do need policies and social safety nets, but you do need to change the productive structure. Now, if you look inside countries, the relationship flips which is kind of cool, you know, from a statistical perspective. You know? <laughs> yeah. Why that might be, our hypothesis right now is that because within countries, you do have more spatial equilibrium. Okay. okay. Yeah. So a, a lot of the effects that Jeffrey West talks about, you know, are effects that are not just about the size of cities, but also about the migration into cities. So sure. Peter Hedstrom has a paper on science advances that finds that a lot of those super lean and scaling relationships described by West and Berencourt are actually quite explained by migrants coming to cities and those migrants being the most talented people. Mm -hmm. So the most talented people from the rural areas are the ones that migrate and help provide that extra punch of productivity that cities have. So a city like New York is very unequal, not because it's only based on New Yorkers. It's because a lot of like poor people migrate to those places, similar to San Francisco. You know, they're like big magnets and attractors of people. And at the country scale, the more complex a region or a city is, the more unequal it is, the least complex, the more equal it is. So you have a Simpsons paradox, you know, not from Homer Simpson, yeah. but the statistical <laughs> Simpson paradox that the correlation that you serve at one scale, I you know, okay. inverts when you disaggregate that data into the next scale. Right. Okay. Well, so then what's the, is there an immediate policy implication for this? So what are we going to do with this knowledge? Yeah. So I, I do think that there are a few things. One thing that we found also related to this is that um, the more complex economic activities concentrate in space much more than the least complex economic activities. That paper is coming out on Nature Human Behavior in a few weeks. And what this tells us is that, well, if at the end of the day, wealth is gonna be increasingly be generated in cities, we do need to have you know, better ways of including more people into cities. Because I think one of the pain points of the United States right now is that the major cities of the US are failing to accommodate more people because of problems in infrastructure, yeah. you know, problems in the ability to build and so forth. So, like, if you think about it, like, San Francisco and San the Francisco Bay Francisco is the worst, obviously. But that, that city in China would be a 20 million people city, yeah. given, you know, like, what it's able to make. But for that, you know, it would have, you know, 27 lines of subway, okay, that would be, like, really fast and modern and autonomous, you know. It, it, it would need to have another type of infrastructure. Like, I don't know if you've been to Shenzhen, I've not been there, but I know about it. Yeah, yeah Shenzhen it just is a, came into existence from nothing. Yeah, exactly. It's twenty-three million people. Like so, so the U.S. haven't hasn't been able to produce twenty-first century megacities. It produced twentieth century megacities, yeah. but nowadays, you know, I think you are going to need to include more people in the centers of production, and if. You don't get together, you know, good infrastructure for transportation. You don't get together good ways of like densifying neighborhoods, you know, in a way that they make them livable, but at the same time are able to include maybe twice the number of people that they had before, maybe three times. You know, you are going to start having more and more social pressure because it's unsustainable to commute for three hours. You know, like people are getting excluded because cities, you know, have the need to include more people than the one that they're able to right yeah. now. I mean, just to play devil's advocate here, I'm probably mostly on your side, but th these are subtle questions. We're, we're having this conversation in the middle of a charming neighborhood of Cambridge, Massachusetts, with a lot of small individual sized houses or at least few unit houses. It, the character of the place would utterly change if the density were that of, of uh, a large uh, Chinese megalopolis, right? And is that entirely good? Well, you know, in, in some ways, I, I live two blocks away from here. Yeah. That's a huge privilege. Yeah, you know? it is. That's a huge privilege. And, and people many don't people, want to give it up. Yeah. Yeah. Many people in my company have to commute much longer and 
that commute is, is part of kind of like their unhappiness. And if you think about it, a lot of the social unrest that is happening in many countries, you know, is happening, you know, is being triggered when the price of gas goes up, when the price of transportation goes up, because commuters are unhappy, you know? Commuters yeah. are the ones that are kind of like excluded and they have to kind of like make a journey every day to the places where people like me that have the privilege to be able to afford a home here, you know, live. So I do think that if they could make Cambridge more, you know, affordable to more people, mm -hmm. you know, I think it probably would be healthier, you know? Maybe we'll be able to hang out at night more and get better ideas for our businesses and for creative activities that we want to do. So I, I, I do think that, if you get along with your neighbors, it's good to have more of them. You know? <laughs> it is. I, I was impressed to learn, not impressed, but uh, interested to learn that the co average commute time goes up and up the more you're in a big city. Yes. So yes. despite the fact that things are more dense and nearby, it takes longer to get there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. New York has more, huge commute times. Yeah, yeah. in LA. Yeah. So, so we have all of that data. You know, we have right. Data USA. We have the main tool to distribute and visualize US public data that we launched in 2016. And there you can create maps of like commute times and you immediately see that when you create the average travel time map, boom, all of the cities light up. When you create the commuting alone map, then, you know, it's the opposite, you know? So commuting alone, you know, it's people driving cars in more rural areas, you know, average travel time, you know, goes <laughs> up, you know, in places like DC and, and, and you know, uh, New York and so forth. Well, that's another side of what you do. So if, information flowing around in different forms and in different media is driving the economy in various ways. We're living in an era now where there's so much information that just dealing with it all is a big issue. So you've been involved in data visualization and projects that, that try to sort of make sense of all this information we're getting. What, what drives you to do that? So it, it, it was a little bit of a, let's say, you know, lucky path, you know, so when I started doing this work on economic complexity and relatedness, um, there were like two big papers that we produced, one in 2007 that came out in Science and another one on PNAS in 2009. And those papers became you know, very popular, uh, but uh, one of the things that those papers had was that they had some non-traditional techniques that we had invented that you could use to predict the products that a country was going to export in the future, you know, that you could use to predict the future economic growth potential, you know, of countries based on their economic structures. And I started to get a lot of demand, you know, of people to generate, you know, reports on, on that type of topic, you know. And, and as a scientist, you know, like you always want to be working on the next thing, you know? Yeah. So like they say, oh, yeah, we want to do like, you know, like a relatedness and complexity analysis for this region of Brazil or for, you know, this or that. And and that was kind of like boring, repetitive work. Sure, because, you've done that already. Yeah, yeah. You, you've done it. So when I started my, uh, my lab at MIT, uh, the first grad student that I hired was Alex Simoes. And the, the job that I gave him is we're going to do like a self-service tool for this demand. I had done something similar before for a paper in which we look at, you know, correlations between diseases using hospitalization records. And Alex started building, you know, this tool, which became the Observatory of Economic Complexity, is now the number one tool to distribute international trade data in the world, you know. And uh, then we found out that, you know, maybe like what people were more interested was on the platform and the tool rather than, you know, the analysis the that the tool made. <laughs> and that was redeployable. So then we created a tool, you know, together with the government of Minas Gerais in Brazil that, you know, integrated uh, data for more than 50 million workers, all of the basically formal sector economy of Brazil, data on, on trade, on industries, you know, and uh, em uh, employment and also education for all of Brazil. And then, you know, uh, together with a colleague from Deloitte, we started working on the creation of a similar platform for the U.S. But one of the things that we did there is that we realized that, you know, we needed to go beyond economic data, you know, so it include data on demographics, on health, on insurance, on, you know, commute times, on you name it, you know, and that's Data USA that was launched in 2016. That project became very popular and, and it became some sort of like the, the dream thing that people in statistics departments of many governments in the world wanted to have. And that started to generate a demand okay. to create more projects like that. So, you know, there's Data Korea now, there is Data Chile, we're releasing Data Mexico on, on January. And we've been creating these tools that what they do is something that is very simple, but it's not easy to do. You know, it's easy to use, but it's hard to do, is to integrate, you know, 15, 20, 30 different data sets 
but not just provide files, but integrate them into narratives. So what we do is we transform data into stories. You know, that's the main form of integration that we provide. That allows people to find the data on the web. You know, the stories have, you know, text that is generated semi-algorithmically using the data, uh, visualizations also, you know. So imagine for the U.S., the U.S. has like 70,000 census-designated places. You know, each one of them has, you know, a complete profile, you know, with more than 70 visualizations and a lot of text right. and information. So even if you're a little town, you have all of your census data and your BEA data and your BLS data in Data USA. And then we have more advanced tools like ways to integrate data and download it, you know, but integrating data from multiple sources, ways of creating custom visualizations. And that has been, you know, something that, that has done, you know, very well. Uh, also, we've done similar solutions for private sector companies in which we integrate the data from their marketing departments and logistics and so forth to create platforms that uh, people can use in a strategic decision making. And are these also useful for academics uh, doing uh, studies of, of yeah. demography or whatever? They, they use it a lot. So like just to give you an idea, right now on our online properties, we get over a million people a month. Okay. You know? Uh, so we run service, you know, to try to figure out, you know, who they are and how we can serve them better. And uh, like a platform like Data USA, you know, uh, uh, thirty-five to forty percent of the people that that visit it, uh, it's like academic of some form, whether it is like a high school student doing a homework, yeah. or whether it is a university professor, you know, using it in some report. Like if you if you go to Google Scholar and you search for the URL, it would be a, a relatively well cited paper, like. Unfortunately, right. you don't get credit for those ones, you know. <laughs> Maybe one day, you know, you're going to be yeah. able to, to put your websites on Google Scholar as well, but that's another story. Um, so we do get people from academia. We do get a lot of people from local governments. Okay. You know? Uh, Can people just go to the website and use it? Is it a fee it's, for it's, service? No, or? it's it's totally free right now. We're thinking maybe in the future to add some freemium features, you yeah. know, for like, you know, people that are using this. Uh, some people use it, for example, to do market analysis, you know, and we could provide like freemium features on that case. But so far it's completely free, open source, you know, uh, so it's a very open project. And is that similar to, you also mentioned offhandedly the um, urban perception the idea of using actual photographs of different places in the city to sort of, but but not just show them in a slideshow, but learn about them yeah. from the, from so the computer. So it's, it's related because if, if you see what I'm interested in, I'm interested on kind of like these applications of science and technology to society, mm. you know? Uh, and one of the things that I, I tried to do over the last decade is to find alternative ways to collect data uh, and hopefully data about aspects of society that have been hard to quantify before. So in 2010, you know, I got the idea that um, we could use Google Street View images to quantify evaluative aspects of cities. You know, which place looks safe, which mm. place look lively, which place you know look depressing, beautiful, and so forth. At that time, a lot of people were like, "Oh, this is crazy. These are all subjective things. <laughs> You're never going to be able to do it. It's all meaningless." But I discovered that on the one hand, there was a literature on urban planning of people that have attempted and had done that many times, but with very, very small sample sizes of both ah. images and, you know, uh, people. So what I did is I did a crowdsourcing study and that quickly became the largest data set ever, you know, of a visual perception service that was called PlacePulse. And that allows us to classify 4,000 images and we got over 100,000 people rating them. And we discovered a few things. First, that people's uh, preferences were very transitive. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not that you know that all over the place. Like if I show you like a picture of a really nice, you know, like beautiful, well kempt neighborhood, and I show you like a picture of a you know like a very you know a sketchy you know favela or industrial you know like people tend to let's say answer that the first one is safer than the second one. And that tends to be quite a universal preference. Right. So so the difference between images is so large that it overwhelms the differences between people. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, And we could use those uh, those scores to like measure, uh, you know, like the but, segregation. But you, don't, you don't know if it's actually safe. All you, all you know is that everyone perceives it to be safe. Yeah, and, safe. and we don't expect it to be because like what we wanted to measure was the perception because right. perception can also have an effect that is independent of whether that location is actually safe or not. Yeah. So they're different things. They don't have to be the same. Actually, I mean, we've all been yeah. in cities in, in neighborhoods where we had said, oh, this looks safe or, oh, this doesn't look safe. Yeah. And, you know, we, articulating why we're saying that might be difficult. Exactly. So what we discovered, though, is that crowdsourcing was very 
limited for the amount of data that we need to collect. So a city like New York, Manhattan alone has about 80,000 street segments. So <laughs> that's a lot of street segments. So yeah. let's say you want to get one image per street segment, you know, yeah. and you want to evaluate that image. And let's say that you, you, you want to compare that image with only 10 others, you know, to be able to get a, a decent score, you know, it's, it's, it's imagine it's like right. college football, but with, you know, like 80,000 teams Can't and 10 games, team, right. you know, yeah. exactly. You know, so it's super underdetermined matrix, you know, still you need a lot of traffic just to evaluate all of those images for one city in one dimension. So what we decided to do is to say, let's grab the data that we have and let's train computer vision algorithms to like do the clicking for us, okay? And we find that actually those computer algorithms work very well and they allowed us to scale to create, you know, urban perception maps with hundreds of thousands of images. And then we could use that to study how perception affected behavior. Okay. And what, what did we find? <laughs> so uh, we teamed up with, with a team of Italian colleagues that had mobile phone data. Uh -huh. And they could see the activity of people in cities as a function of the time of the day. You know? Okay. okay. So yeah. uh, then we could see if people tended to avoid unsafe looking places, you know, uh, controlling for distance to the subway, for distance yeah. to the central business district, for other things like um, the uh, density of jobs, the density of population, and so forth. And we did find very interesting effects. So we first we find that like people tend to avoid unsafe looking places. Like after controlling for all those things, you find less people in those places than you would expect. And those effects are modulated by demographics. So it's stronger for women hmm. and for the elderly, but it's reversed for, you know, people below 30. So like young people tend to like- They hang out in those areas. Hang out yeah. on the unsafe looking places, you know, young males especially, <laughs> you know? But like elderly women tend to avoid those places. And, 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 and it kind of like makes sense, but it helped formalize something that I think we'll have an intuition for, but now, you know, we actually have like, you know, hardcore data to be able to show it. I mean, it's another example of what we were talking about, a different way of thinking about uh, conceptualizing, a different kind of information in some sense, or at least a different way of, uh, of sharing it and, and thinking about it. And that's the other, the last thing I wanted to ask you about was how this relates to your interest in collective memory. I did have one uh, podcast guest, Lynn Kelly, who studies memory palaces, ancient memory palaces. Okay. So the idea of remembering things by associating them with you know physical geographical locations, she thinks that Stonehenge, for example, was used as a way of remembering what you would call know-how, right? Okay. Tacit knowledge that was, because they didn't have writing, they couldn't pass it down that easily. But uh, nowadays we have the internet, we have books, we have TV. It's a very different kind of thing? How has our collective memory of, of who we are and, and what kinds of things we pay attention to been affected by these technological changes? Yeah, so I've, I've studied how collective memory uh, is affected by, by technology, language, and time. So uh, we did a paper, you know, with Steve Pinker and other people in which we looked at the network of global languages, okay? Uh, so that's a network in which each node is a language, and languages are connected if they're likely to be translated or spoken by the same people. So let's say English might be connected to German if a lot of books get yes. translated from one language to another, and a lot of people that speak German also speak English and so forth. And we map that network using three data sets, a data set with over 2 million book translations, uh, Twitter, so we detected the language you know, of tweets, and then if you tweet in English and you tweet in Spanish, you know, I can connect those two languages because you are expressing knowledge of both and Wikipedia edits, you know? So okay. it's not reading Wikipedia, but if you edited the page, you know, of Einstein in German and you edited the page of Einstein in English, you probably know how to write in German. So you probably know both languages. Uh, and interestingly enough, when we compare that network, you know, uh, with a data set that we created of globally famous people, we found that the centrality of a language in that network explained the number of famous people produced by the language better than the population of that language, better than the wealth <laughs> of that language, you know? So that tells us, hey, you know, like fame, you know, or global fame, it's, it's something that is very much dependent on, on like this network because if you think about it, the network of languages is like the most aggregate version of the global social network that you can have. Mm. You cannot mm -hmm. have a social relationship if you don't speak a language, you know? You cannot make a sure. friend just by nodding, you know? So uh, in that context, you know, we, we learned that 
you know, much of what the world knows is going to be modulated by by this network, you know, and there's a lot of implications about that, you know. So just to, just yeah. to be clear, does, is the network take the form of saying things like, if you know English, you're more likely to know French than Chinese, whereas if you know Chinese, you're more likely to know Korean than to know English, things like that? Exactly, yeah. So yeah. The, the network gathers all those links. It's, it's you know... It, there are paths between every language and every language, but a language like English, for instance, is a global hub, you know? Yeah. So someone from Portugal and someone from Vietnam, probably they're going to speak something. The most likely thing is they're going to speak English. Yeah, you know? it's a bad example. But there's also like regional hubs, you know? So like, for example, French connects a lot with African languages, you know? Uh, also, you know, Spanish connects with like, you know, Quechua and, you know, uh, Mapudungun and other, you know, languages from, you know, sa uh, native South America, you know? Then you have also Arabic as being as another regional hub, Chinese, you know, and then you have language like Russian is a very important regional hub on all, you know, uh, like Eastern Europe and uh, Northeast Asia, you know, and then you have peripheral languages. So it's a very hierarchical network with like English sitting mm -hmm. at the center, then a ring of, you know, regional hubs, and then, you know, like smaller languages that are kind of like on the periphery, you know, connected to some of those regional hubs. Um, I would love to see a picture of this. Is there an image yeah, out there? Yeah, language. The the right. All right, very good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and then we also studied how uh, communication technologies affected uh, our collective memory. And we used this data set that we've created of over 70,000 famous biographies uh, to look at how changes in technology change the number of globally famous people that were born each year and the occupations associated to those people. So for instance, you know, when you think of, you know, Einstein, he would be a physicist. When you think of Michelangelo, he would be, you know, a painter, you know. And what you find is that when new communication technologies were introduced, the composition of our collective memory changed, not only the size. So before printing, you look at the matrix of our collective memory, and it's mostly political and religious leaders. Okay. After printing... Bosses of hierarchies one way or the other. Exactly, right? you know. Uh, after printing, you get famous artists and famous scientists for the first time. You get a lot of painters, you get composers, you know, you start getting astronomers, writers. you know, <laughs> writers, you know, that, that are also there. But then there is the second printing era, which we talked before, when people start doing like shorter formats and so forth. And there you have an explosion on the sciences. Then now you start differentiating, you know, yeah, natural okay. philosophy into more sciences. You know, you get a lot of famous writers and so forth and composers, you know. And then you have the invention of film and radio, and that generates a huge shift on the arts. Because before that, it was the painter and the composer. Then it's about the performer. Right. So it's the musician, it's the singer. Composers disappear. Musicians and singers are the ones that now become famous. Actors become famous, not playwriters anymore. You know, So there's kind of like that shift. And then you have the introduction of television. With television, you create the fame of sportsmen. Mm -hmm. No, because the sportsmen were not that kind famous performer, yeah. Yeah, before television. And and it's a live performance, you know? Like, it has to be at the right time when you watch the game. And and visible and 3D and, yeah. Like exactly. It's, you can experience it there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. So so you do have kind of like that change in the composition of our collective memory with the introduction of, of communication technologies. And, and it's it's very clear. So to me, when now when I think about, like, the history, I don't think about, like, the modern times and the Renaissance and the things that I learned in school, <laughs> I think of it in terms of like, okay, what was the dominant communication technology at the time? And that's the era that yeah. I set myself in. And what's going to come next? Yeah. So the next thing that I... Instagram influencers? <laughs> ah, next on that. Uh, like, well, what what is... Uh, do you know TikTok? I know of it. I've never used it yet. Oh, dude. I'm far far it's, behind. It's <laughs> no, uh, You don't need an account to watch. Oh, okay. That okay. already tells you something. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's massive... I think in, in different ways. First, it's like the, the quality of the performance that you observe there, it's, it's very good. You know, the amount of attention also that is on TikTok, it's, it's amazing. Like there's, you know, like all of these videos getting like millions and millions and millions of likes. So it's not, you know, like a marginal traffic. Right. It's, it's huge, you know. And it's the first global social media because it's a Chinese company. Mm. So it's the only social media that is popular in both China and the West, you know. Uh, which makes it quite interesting as a, as, a, as a global phenomena, you know, and it's not based on uh, peer communication. It's, it's, it's actually broadcasting. So in, oh, okay. in TikTok, you have like two channels, the For You, which is like a TV feed in which you just scroll, and the Following, which is the people that you're following, and you have a feed of who you follow. And that's it. 
You know, you can search, the search is horrible. It doesn't work, you know, it's like yeah. that doesn't provide good results. And, and it's very passive like television. So they reinvented television for the phone era, you know, in a zapping world in which like content is 15, 30 seconds long. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's those 15 or 30 seconds, there's a lot of good quality content at, at, at that range of size. I mean, Twitter and podcasts are as cutting edge as they're going to get, I think, technologically, but yeah. they, they keep coming along very quickly. So, yeah. And so I, I guess the the point is that how we think about ourselves uh, mm. changes when these media change, right? How we remember ourselves. Indeed. What I want to say about TikTok though, that I like, which is interesting, I do think that it's more social and more family. So when I use Twitter, I use it by myself. When I use Facebook, I use it by myself. Mm. When I watch TikTok, I'm in the couch with my wife and my daughter and the three of us are looking at the same screen at the same time and talking about what we're watching. And I do think that that's important because we do have a lot of interactions right now in which people are interacting with screens independently. Yeah. And I grew up, probably you grew up, you know, with people sitting in front of a television and, and, and having that more of as a collective experience, you know, in which you had to negotiate what you watch, mm -hmm. you have to talk about what you watch. And, and, and I do find that, you know, that's, that's a good thing compared to like the social media that has been more peer-to-peer -peer but isolating. Well, I like to end on optimistic notes. Is that your optimistic note? I mean, what do you think about the future? What, what should our uh, I, optimism be? Where should it be located? I, I, I'm an optimist, you know, and I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I think yeah, it's I maybe genetics. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but uh, I, I tend to be optimistic even though, you know, like today, you know, Chile is going through a very difficult moment with all of the, the, the things that have happened there during the last four or five days. Um, but I, I do think that at the end of the day, you know, um, the positive things in life tend to add up, you know, and build on each other better than the negative things in life. Uh, so going back to the beginning, we talked about where information and order grows, and that's because our ability to create order and complexity is larger than the rate at which it's getting destroyed. And I think that's also true for many of the positive things, you know. Uh, so I, I, I am an optimist because I do think that at the end of the day, you know, things add up, you know, better, you know, uh, as, as we move along. All right. Cesar Hidalgo, uh, thanks for some good information there. Thanks for being on the podcast. Hey, my pleasure.